Well, welcome everybody to uh, our zoning forum. Um, this is a joint uh, venture of the Leeds Civic Association and Bay State Village Association. My name is Peter McLean. I'm part of the Bay State Village Association. Um, and we'll uh, be getting to talking zoning really soon. Um, I'm glad that you're able to make it. Uh, I will put a little quick plug in for the Village Association and thank uh, a couple of people, particularly Alex Gieslin at the back, who was a big part of getting this put together. Um, and all those of you who are interested in the Village Association, you want to know that we meet uh, on the fourth Tuesday of every month at Pfeiffer Skillets at school at 7 in the evening. And we do a lot of fun things. And we try and do also fulfill our mission of providing informational sessions like this that we're doing tonight. Um, Alex, did you want to say anything quick about Leeds, put you on the spot right away? Uh, um, well, I thank you guys for um, letting us join in. We have, I think, maybe a few people coming from Leeds, but um, we just kind of want to sit in and see how any of the changes are going to affect us um, and go from there. All right. And Alex is the <coughs> president? Yep. A president yep. of the Leeds Civic Association. So tonight we're going to talk about, about the proposed changes for uh, zoning and we're fo focusing on uh, residential area URB, which is what uh, most of Bay State Village is and much of Leeds is as well. Some of you may have been to some forums like this in the past. Uh, we've been talking about these issues for a while. Um, the issues that we'll be touching upon, I think, are things like increasing population density towards the center of towns or the center, centers of, um, of the city. Uh, <clears throat> often called infill is a term people might recognize. Recognizing the increase in home businesses, looking to have mixed industrial and residential spaces, um, making life more walkable for us, making life more accessible on our bicycles perhaps. Uh, these are the kinds of principles that came from the sustainability plan that Northampton put together, which is a while ago now. The sustainability plan, one of the things that it led to was a zoning revisions commission that met for two years. Uh, and the zoning revisions committee uh, put forward uh, suggestions, plans to the planning board. Um, from the ZRC, uh, the planning board has taken those suggestions into consideration and is now at the point of putting these things into proposed law that would become law as they go through the city council. Um, tonight, we're really uh, pleased to have Carolyn Mish here, who is a senior planner. And uh, Carolyn is going to take over for me talking. <laughs> and we're really wanting to focus, I think, a lot on Bay State and on Leeds um, and um, talk about the, the, the impact of the uh, proposals for zoning in these areas. Uh, this is very much an information session. Part of the, the mission, certainly, of the Village Association is to provide these opportunities <coughs> for people to come, hear things, ask questions, uh, and learn. Um, and that is really what we're hoping to come away from this this evening, uh, having fulfilled that, that opportunity for folks. Um, so, Carolyn? Thanks, Go ahead. Peter. Um, good evening. Um, glad to see all of you here. It's nice to um, be able to get out and get some um, more feedback. As Peter said, we've been um, discussing this process for a number of years, probably going back 10 years. And what I'm going to do is um, I want to, we've had some public forums on these specific zoning changes already um, starting back in September. So. Um, for those of you who weren't able to attend those or um, aren't familiar with them or want to re-familiarize yourself with those, I thought I would go through the presentation that we put together for that purpose. It will involve, and this is really talking about, again, sort of the neighborhood, changes to the core neighborhoods for the city that really comprise about two-thirds of the neighborhoods in, in the city of Northampton is um, what the zoning package is really looking at, at modifying. Um, so I will mostly focus, because um, I know this is targeted um, for um, the neighborhoods uh, around Bay State and Leeds, which um, are 
primarily zoned urban residential B and a little bit of A in Leeds, um, urban residential A. And I'll explain what those mean as well. Um, but I also want to touch on urban residential C, which is the core area around downtown, just so you can get a sense of um, how the pieces fit together and how it's important to sort of talk about all of them and how they affect the city as a whole. Um, so I just, this first slide is really just an introduction um, um, with the planning board members um, and um, Office of Planning Development staff, which is where I work. Um, and um, what we're talking about, and again, I'll focus on the um, A and B district, but the, um, it's really these neighborhoods, which are sort of color-coded, doesn't show up so well on the production of the lights, but urban residential A um, is this greenish area that, this is Look Park, but here's leads up here. Um, there's a little bit that comes down to Florence, um, a bordering Bridge Road, and um, there's a little bit of A here off of Ryan Road. Um, but urban residential B is sort of the, are all the neighborhoods that surround Florence Center and go along Elm Street and down into Bay State, of course, um, and then out um, along Elm Street, heading into Northampton Center. There's some urban residential A in the um, Woodlawn, Jackson Street neighborhood and a little pocket around Round Hill. Um, and then this darker orange is sort of the core around um, the Central Business District, Northampton downtown, um, is urban residential C. So um, that's the map generally of the, the neighborhoods that we're talking about. Um, and again, to sort of reiterate some of the things Peter said about um, the timeline for these ordinances, we're, we're, we really want to take, what we've done is we had some public forums coming out of the summer, so back in September, um, with draft ordinances. From those, we got some feedback from people about um, potential modifications. We also said any neighborhood that wants to have more detailed discussion and, and really sort of focus on what it means in different blocks or, um, on in different streets and how, how might it change neighborhoods, we offered that we would come out to anybody who wants to hold a forum, we would certainly come and explain in more detail. So that's one of the, we, we did that with Ward 3 back in October, and so now this is another opportunity for more residents to sort of come and listen. But so the ordinances have not been introduced yet to city council. So this is just sort of a quick timeline about how, what happens when there's an ordinance? City Council ultimately votes on adopting any changes that um, are zoning related. And so we haven't gotten to the point yet. This is still sort of the input and, and um, modification period before it officially gets introduced to City Council, at which point there will then be official public hearings and referral out to other subcommittees of City Council. Um, before ultimately any kind of change comes back to city council um, for a, a vote up or down. Um, there were lots of comments from our initial meeting, and you, you know, I may hear more of those from you tonight about concerns and issues related to the zoning changes, that they, the zoning changes could result in encouraging more walkability. There was a concern about whether or not the zoning might generate more traffic on local streets, but overall reduce um, um, traffic around surround major streets. There was a lot of discussion about needing more housing options throughout the city for people of all income levels and all house interest in all housing types, from small to large. Um, and a lot of discussion about design details. And since then, we've sort of come back and looked at ways we might be able to address design because people are concerned about how changes in the neighborhood might might be might look uh, what what new construction might look like um, and discussion about whether or not any of these changes might result in massive shifts in neighborhood character um, and whether um, there's also quite a discussion about making sure there was a level playing field that at, you know everyone in the city we've talked a lot about sustainability and what sustainability might mean, um, and that um, there should be clear rules and that, that we should really be as a community again sort of fulfilling that goal towards sustainability, not just focusing on one neighborhood over another to absorb some of that. Um, um, need for development and, and um, 
different types of housing options. Um, so going back a little bit even further, just to recap again, I said this has been going on about 10 years of the conversation, but officially we had a, a sustainable Northampton process that started in 2005, 2006. Um, and as Peter mentioned, as a, uh, coming off the heels of that, there was a special committee established to look at um, rules and regulations that could be implemented to, um, that would affect change um, based on the policy um, decisions that were drafted in that plan. Um, and so um, then after, so that was a two-year process. And towards the end of that, we also had a separate parallel process where um, the housing partnership um, consulted or contracted with a consultant to do a housing needs assessment for the city, which was much more detailed about the types of housing um, demand that there is in Northampton at, at all um, income levels and affordability levels. And so that's really been a key piece also in, in plugging into this um, and looking at the needs um, to address all of the residents in Northampton. Um, <clears throat> I just want to go over a few data points that I think is important to sort of address. Some people ask why we um, are, if we have a flat population or a slightly declining population, why do we need more housing and why is there sort of continuous demand for housing? Well, over the years, as reflected also nationally, our um, household size has been dropping. And in particular, the small, the um, more urban neighborhoods, the household sizes have dropped from about two and to over two and a half persons per household to um, down to 1.6 in the um, multifamily or higher density neighborhoods. So we've really shifted the way we live, and um, which has then sort of reduced the total number um, of units available for those smaller smaller um, household sizes. Um, one of the things that the Zoning Revisions Committee evaluated, had time to evaluate, they certainly couldn't get through the entire analysis of, of how um, the residential zones should be or could be changed, but one of the things that they really looked at was that the existing neighborhoods that everybody loves and values could not be rebuilt under the current regulatory structure that we have now. And so that was one of the pieces um, that came into play as well in sort of analyzing where we are in sustainability and where what we are as a community. Um, and in looking at that, they, they were they picked out certain neighborhoods, but there were some streets. This this picture shows if I don't know if you can see some red X's through Walnut Street, which indicate that just on lot size alone, these you, these houses don't conform to the current zoning. Which means essentially the policy statement for the city right now is to say we don't want this neighborhood. This neighborhood should be wiped out, and there should be much. We should have a much bigger. Um, you know, sprawling sort of way of, of building out. Um, so um, <clears throat> they looked at that, and it wasn't just the case on a block, you know, in, in certain blocks. It was really widespread throughout the urban residential A, B, and um, C neighborhoods. Um, the housing analysis that I mentioned previously showed um, a, a much greater demand than we had really understood for um, affordable units and units being close to services. Um, <clears throat> so these are all sort of related to, or, you know, the goals in Sustainable Northampton is trying to accommodate um, the different demands for housing types um, and in walkable or bikeable service areas. Um, <clears throat> we also, the idea is to adjust the zoning to reflect those historic development patterns because we know those neighborhoods work, we know they're high value neighborhoods, and so a policy that says that, you know, we really don't want to build in that pattern anymore is sort of contrary to the way that, that people have really enjoyed and, and loved their neighborhoods. Um, the other idea is that, you know, we went through this um, period of time, and it's not unique to Northampton, but where we had integrated neighborhoods, we had all different types of housing um, stock mixed throughout the neighborhoods. We might have apartment build 20 unit apartment buildings in the middle of a single family um, residential neighborhood or two or three families sprinkled in. And then, it, and that sort of happened historically going back to, you know, from the beginning of Northampton's history up until the 
maybe 50s, 60s, where then we decided that um, apartment units and um, more affordable units should be clustered and segregated into different um, areas. So we've got you know, examples of Hampshire Heights and Florence Heights and, and um, neighborhoods of that sort, where we've really consolidated one type of housing unit as opposed to allowing a, a more of an organic dispersion of, of those housing types throughout the city. Um, and so historically, we had this pattern of mixed units, but now the zoning doesn't allow for that um, as it currently stands. Um, so the goals in this zoning, which we can get into and, and discuss more detail on a neighborhood or block by block basis, are to allow a modest number of new units within the neighborhoods, enable greater choice um, that reflects the existing conditions on the ground, um, allow units to be um, built that are accessible to infrastructure, goods and services, um, create flexibility for change in family structures. As we know, family sizes are um, expanding and contracting. Um, certainly more um, household sizes are contracting. But we've got lots of older housing stock that is um, many times, in many cases, bigger than what families need. And there's not that ability to say, you know, I could stay in my, I really want to stay in my house, but I can't afford it anymore. It's too much space for me. But the zoning doesn't allow me to create a separate unit for that. Um, but the, the goal also is to maintain um, neighborhood character. There's a picture here. Um, you all may recognize this house, but there are many examples of this. Um, where this is an over 3,000 um, square foot house. Um, and it's historically been two units, but it was on the market for a very long time because nobody could figure out what to do with it. It was just too big of a structure for two units, and the zoning wouldn't allow more. So it, it's that kind of thing to allow preservation um, of, of um, homes and allow reinvestment in those older homes um, by recouping some of that money sometimes um, by allowing additional units to be created in those, in those structures to sort of offset those costs. Um, so just again, and the other piece of the zoning is really to try to simplify the ordinance. We've got a lot of different categories, um, even in the B and A, not so much maybe the urban residential A districts, but certainly the B and C districts, where if you have a two family, your lot size requirement is X, but if you have a three family, it's a different, you know, you have different heights and setbacks and things like that. And the goal really is to say, whatever housing type you have, this is your formula, and, and make it much simpler for people to understand, make it more flexible, and allow, a mo again, a modest number of units. Um, um, and then finally, the other piece of this ordinance is different, is that we've introduced some, the initial pieces of design um, to address some of the concerns about neighborhood character. We've never had, the only place in, in the city right now where we have design standards is for the central business, um, the downtown. And um, we have an historic district along Elm Street where the, the homes fronting on Elm Street have um, to go through historic review. But those are very specific, relevant to uh, preserving the historic integrity of that neighborhood. Um, and then downtown is more of a, a vibrancy and design issue relative to vibrancy. So this would really, um, this introduces a new element that we haven't had in, in residential neighborhoods before. Um, <clears throat> just to go over the, in a broad sense, the changes, and I have copies, they're also on our website. I do have a few copies of the proposed tables they're very dense, and I don't. It's not um, necessarily fun reading, but certainly if you want to look at them, or if you want to go to our website, um, and also call me afterwards with all the questions you may or may not have, it's fine. But just sort of generally, I want to talk about the the changes that sort of relate to simplifying the ordinance. It really the idea is to have one standard for all different types of housing that might be allowed in a district, but to use open space. Um, and parking as sort of the threshold for the number of units you can put on a property. And that makes more of a difference in the C district, which I'll go into um, a little bit later, so it doesn't necessarily concern Bay State and Leeds so much, but um, 
we heard through this public process that open space and preserving a sort of neighborhood, whether it's public open space or really someone else's backyard, was important. So um, there's a little bit of tweaking in the open space requirements, and open space means anything that's not building or paved over for a driveway, essentially. Um, and right now, there's a 50% in every lot for the B district or the Bay State and Leeds districts. Um, there's a 50% open space requirement. In Leeds for the A district, there's a 60% open space requirement. We've tweaked that number a little bit to allow <coughs> a little bit more flexibility for building on a lot, but um, essentially it means instead of determining how big your lot is to determine how many units you are, you're allowed, as long as you're maintaining that minimum open space and you're providing off-street parking, then you could have you know, one or two units in your um, structure. Um, <coughs> there's still site plan approval criteria for anything that's not a single family home over 2,000 square feet, that doesn't change. Um, we also took the opportunity to make some changes to uses that we didn't think were appropriate in neighborhoods, like getting rid of the junk car special permits, um, meaning you could have a junkyard now in the residential districts by special permit, which really didn't seem to make sense. Um, and no one was really clamoring to keep that in the ordinance, so we thought this was a good opportunity to take that away. Um, we've also made some modifications to the um, um, solar array provisions, um, but we haven't, in this iteration, looked at changing the boundaries for any of these zoning districts. So moving urban residential A to urban residential B, or C to B, or what have you. So um, none of no, what we call map changes, so that colored map I showed before is not being proposed to be changed. Um, so are there any questions to this point before I go into some of the details about the AE district? Yeah, you, you talk about um, <coughs> modest numbers and making modest changes. Mm -hmm. Is modest going to be defined in this uh, proposal or is that just some sort of like concept that we have to understand? Because, you know, your, your idea of modest might not be my idea yep. of modest. Yep. Well, um, when I go through the details, I'll, I'll explain some of the, the changes. So it really ta is about the, the changes in dimensions for lots. So I talked about before that we're, right now, for instance, in the urban residential B neighborhoods, you need 8,000 square feet and 75 feet of frontage um, to create a single family house lot. Um, many of the house lots don't comply with that now. So. We're because they were built before the rules right. came in. Right. Right. And so it's that's a natural. much more spread out kind of form of, of um, development. The zoning would um, anticipate, with those numbers, that, that kind of number anticipates a much um, <coughs> lower density kind of form than what um, <coughs> would be um, appropriate to create options potentially in the future for. Um, better bus service or access to um, goods and services. So, um, <clears throat> and so the lot size changes are, would be to reflect more of what the majority of the lots already are in that neighborhood. Couldn't, couldn't many of these things that you were describing to us earlier be dealt with, you know, like you showed us this, that odd looking house with the sort of tower next mm -hmm. to it. Can't you just put like a case by case exception clause? I bet it already exists. You know, where you just say, you know what, this is a special case. Let, let's step round the audiences because this makes sense to do this at, at, at this moment. Rather than sort of like scoop everybody up into this, you know, vanilla ordinance that is meant to suit everybody and meant to suit every neighbourhood and every situation. Um, that is potentially one way of addressing um, um, some of the concern. The idea isn't just to allow people with large homes to be able to add units. Oh, well, there are two, I guess it's twofold. One is um, a, uh, the special permit process is, um, does oftentimes create a barrier for people if they're homeowners who might not um, want to go through the risk of applying, not knowing whether they could get a permit. You also should really have parameters for why the board might approve such a permit as opposed to just saying having a blanket special permit. Um, 
And I think the other idea is to, to create a level playing field so that, so that um, there's um, essentially equal opportunity for everyone in a neighborhood to, to know sort of what, what might be coming or what's appropriate. And also to provide enough opportunity for people to have different types of housing options and not just make it based on whether or not you happen to have a big structure that might be able to be converted. So I think the idea is really to sort of create and facilitate um, a more level playing field for everyone. When you, um, when you showed us that illustration, that <coughs> photograph of uh, Walnut Street, I couldn't quite understand what you were trying to tell us. To me, it sounded like you were saying that the houses were too close to each other. Um, it, it depends on the, on the type of uses. What it means is, so I, as I mentioned, there's a minimum, the way the zoning works now is there's a minimum lot size requirement for a single family home. There's a minimum, a different minimum lot size if you have a two family or a three family. Mm -hmm. So, um, on, and then on top of that, there are frontage requirements and setback requirements. In that example, um, just looking at lot size on the per unit basis, the lots were not large enough by today's zoning um, to be built. So if you were to start with a sort of same land area, you would not be able to create those structures in that neighborhood the way that it was historically built because of the, because of the larger lots that are now required in zoning. So, can I, I'd like to comment on that too, having been on the Zoning Visions Committee. It seemed very ironic that we had these communities we identified that we wanted to maintain, but the zoning wouldn't allow you to recreate it now. And so I thought when you showed it, that was a very nice illustration. All those houses couldn't be built under the current zoning. No, I, I understand it. I just don't really, to be honest with you, I don't really see how it's relevant to this discussion. They're there. They were built when the rules were different. They're not going to change. They're not going to go away because, you know, because we changed the rules. But they could go away. I mean, there could be um, a catastrophic event. Maybe there's an empty tooth on the street that, that uh, a lot that was never built, but then couldn't be built. Maybe a, maybe maybe a planner it, buys four or five, knocks them down, puts up a condo. Um, in an extreme situation, that potentially could happen. But that's not the way our neighborhoods are built out. There have been more organic changes where or individuals come in and make modest uh, modifications to structure. So the okay. idea is really to say, well, let's reflect. We all, <coughs> these neighborhoods work. We love them. They're high value. Why do we have a policy that basically says we don't want that anymore? We would not ever encourage that again. And so it's, it, a lot of it is about meshing um, policy to the regulatory framework that's at hand. So why don't I take one more question and then go into the details of how these, these um, changes are. Go ahead. Uh, what he was proposing is what's called spot zoning. And if I live next door to a one family house and all of a sudden they decide to make a three family out of it and they just go and they do it. Spot zoning, you see, sounds like it would solve some problems, but it would create some problems for neighbors when they right. feel that it isn't fair that just these people, you know, right. can do what they want. Um, so in the urban residential A um, neighborhoods, again, um, you know, sort of discount this whole block here because that's Look Park. But um, this is all sort of north of Look Park is urban residential A. Um, and then again, sort of going along Bridge Road here and then dipping down a bit in um, Florence. And then there's some more A over here um, along the bike path. Um, so the um, current, um, the, the proposal would be to change the lot size, frontage, open space, and, and lot depths. Um, um, Currently, there's a 12,000 square foot lot size, 75 feet of frontage, and 60% open space. Um, so the proposal is to um, bring that to 5,000 square feet, 50 feet of frontage, and 40% open space, still only allowing single family homes with accessory apartments, which are currently allowed in any single family home. Um, and then just to go in as an example of that type of neighborhood, this is an urban residential neighborhood, A, neighborhood on Ridgewood Terrace, 
where uh, most of these lots fronting, you can see the Jackson Street School back here, there's a bike path um, right here, the Northampton um, Rail Trails here. Um, these lots are 50 foot frontage lots and between 5,500 and 7,000 square foot lot size. So we have those um, lot sizes in the urban residential A um, neighborhood and what this would do would be essentially to allow some amount of, um, and in fact in this picture there's an example of where this might allow one or two new single family homes to be built, maybe just one here actually at the end of this uh, Blackberry Lane. Um, and there's um, a leftover parcel here that doesn't have the right depth um, to meet the current zoning. But you know this is an area where from a sustainability perspective, it makes sense to allow some, you know, one, maybe two single family um, houses to be built where you've got direct access to the bike path, you're walkable to a school, you're certainly um, walkable to King Street, um, and on the bike path to Florence Center. So that's an example of what that might um, look like <coughs> and how that exists on the ground today, actually. Um, in urban residential B, which are the yellow um, um, highlighted areas, there's some area along South Street, this is um, Bay State here, all surrounding um, Florence Center. There's a little bit up here along Water Street. Um, <clears throat> I don't think, sort of looking at the map, I don't think the B changes would really be um, affect Water Street just given the build out that started there and the fact that the mill is <coughs> there, you can't really subdivide new lots within 200 feet of a um, water, uh, of a perennial um, stream. But uh, um, the current lot size, as I mentioned, is 8,000 square feet, so the proposal will be to match A um, as a 5,000 square foot lot, 50 feet of frontage, and 40% open space. It's currently 50%, so it's a, um, a downward adjustment. Um, <clears throat> allow up to, uh, currently you're allowed a three family by special permit, um, but you have to have a much larger lot size um, than a single family house lot. And there had been some discussion through this public process, hearing process or public discussion about potentially introducing, um, allowing four, four families um, or four units within a structure. And this came up really as more of a mechanism of allowing um, greater felt flexibility for, um, in the context of those um, bigger houses that might make more sense to divide up into four units instead of three. Um, <coughs> and then um, also allowing a more than one structure on a lot, um, which is just sort of a, a one of those leftover zoning issues that's buried in the code where you're not allowed to have more than one principal structure on a parcel. But there had been some discussion in the Zoning Revisions Committee about um, uh, allowing new types of layout, so <coughs> what's called um, small house or cottage um, build out where you might have you know, 900 square foot units, but they're detached, so they feel like a single family home, but they're on shared, a shared parcel. Is there a, um, a limit to the parcel size for that? Uh, 5,000 square feet, but again, the open space would be the cap. So if you exceeded, you <coughs> could only do as much on a parcel up to um, the open space cap, and you also need to provide parking. So the parking and the open space work together, because the more parking you have, the less open space. So once you hit the 40%, then you're done. So you might, there might be an example where you have enough lot area for, to add another unit, but um, you don't have, um, you can't provide parking, off street parking, and so that's the cap. That's the thing that prevents you from adding that other unit. Um, <clears throat> so some examples is, are the expansion, again, of sort of a larger home, um, potentially being able to divide it into more units in the upper corner. And then um, another example in this lower corner is an urban residential B neighborhood where there's um, a lot that is next, there, there are two lots owned by the same party, and right now under current zoning you can't build on it, but if you're going down the street, there's sort of a rhythm of houses, and then you get to this big open space where a house either was previously, or um, for whatever reason, 
may, may have been built. I think in this case, there was a house that burned um, many years ago. And so now you sort of have this big, what we call the term sort of an empty tooth um, in the neighborhood, or a gap. And, um, and so this person actually um, had other provisions in the zoning to potentially allow for building on such a parcel. And um, it is a special permit process. It is onerous, and it doesn't always work for um, folks. But in this case, it would. Um, this person is going to build an attached to family because the um, and make a much bigger structure connected in order to meet the zoning requirements. Whereas the rhythm on the street is really more um, deta smaller detached structures. So the zoning would help enable that person to build what the current pattern is on the street as opposed to what the zoning right now sort of forces them into this um, structure that may not, uh, that wouldn't necessarily fit with the rest of the structures on the street. Um, and I'll skip through quickly urban residential C, which is surrounding downtown. Lot sizes um, go from 6,000 square feet to 3,000 square feet, 50, again, 50 feet of frontage. 30% open space is what it currently is, so that's not, that doesn't change. But what changes is more um, simplifying it so that you can have any kind of configuration of units and it doesn't, it, and it doesn't, you don't have to reevaluate what your lot size and frontage requirements are. Um, and there were multiple heights depending on the type of structure you were building, so that proposal is to eliminate that and just have one standard across the board. <coughs> um, and there's some other examples of sort of being able to reuse units and encourage um, more units closer to downtown where there might be missing um, gaps on the street and the streetscape. Um, so again, the goal is really to um, encourage sustainability by allowing a mix of units in different places within walking distance to schools and services. Um, re really reducing the pressure for building large-scale affordable housing units in, in clusters away from um, and not so well integrated into neighborhoods. Um, preserving neighborhood character by allowing um, reinvestment in those older structures and being able to, um, you know, recapture some of that um, money that is required to go into um, preserving those structures. Um, and then, so at this, oops, um, so I can go, so what the other thing I did for tonight for Base 8 and Leeds is I've gone in and I worked with Alex um, to pick out some parcels in Base 8 to sort of look like, look at what that might mean for the neighborhoods. Um, I also want to say that based on um, some of the, um, discussions we've already had uh, with the planning board and, and through these other public um, discussions, we've tweaked the proposal to add a little bit more language about design and concern about sort of that the, the new structures and, and big additions really need to fit into the character of a block face and a neighborhood. So that's, um, we, did a couple of things. We bulked up on that language, and then we've also contracted with an architectural firm to sketch out <coughs> what those design standards mean, um, so that it's clear um, what what standard the planning board will be reviewing um, for for development of, of a site. Um, so, uh, we'll just if you want me to go ahead and launch into some of these examples, we, um, Alex and I talked about doing a couple of examples on Riverside Drive and then, um, and then some examples in, in Leeds. So I can go through that and then obviously if you had questions about other ones, I've got Google Earth up, we can sort of scan around and look at other things um, if you want to do well, that. Well, we did uh, one specifically on federal, the corner of federal yep. and Milton, which I think is an important one. Yeah, yeah. So I have about five examples, so I can run through those. Yeah. I wanted to ask Carol um, that I, I had been imagining, and maybe it was wishful thinking on my part, that one of the reasons for doing this type of development was to also preserve other larger areas of open land. Yeah. To have some intentional, if, that if we were kind of clustering our housing yep. into closer proximity to each other, that we would also be. Am I, was I, 
imagining? No, no, no. That certainly is the policy set forth in the Sustainable Northampton Plan. So, what we've as as you've seen in the description of the timeline, this is this is an incremental process, and we're just trying to tackle these things as, as we can. So we've worked on some commercial district changes. Now we're working on these core neighborhoods. We also addressed, made some zoning modifications to the outlying area, actually the water supply protection area, um, to clarify the standards there because there were some urban residential, underlying urban residential neighborhood um, um, districts within those um, areas that we really want to protect for drinking water supply. So we've done that piece. There's still more to do on the outlying area. We're, we're going to make some changes to our cluster ordinance that would really encourage any development that's sort of happening on the outline, in the outlying areas to be in a cluster um, configuration to protect those um, natural resources. So that's on the radar too. Um, and so through this year, 2013, there's going to be lots of zoning changes coming forward to City Council, and you know this one happens to be the first residential one that we're that we're tackling. But yes, there is that other issue of looking at the rural residential areas. Thank you. Um, so this is an example: 167 Riverside Drive. It's quite um, it's a large parcel, particularly compared to the surrounding parcels. I don't know if you can see the lot lines here, but um, there, um, uh, I just went through got some data points on this. Um, it's about a 48,000, and let me just back up and say that I don't have survey quality data for any of these parcels we're looking at. So I'm, that's the big caveat here is that we're going to look in generalities just to describe sort of what might, what kinds of things um, that we would be thinking about in terms of the zoning change and what, how that might affect. So. These numbers may be off, but they, I think they give, they'll give you a sense anyway of sort of what the zoning might do uh, or might, how it might affect um, certain parcels. So this is um, approximately a 48,000 square foot lot. It has 148 feet of frontage. It clearly meets the open space, minimum open space of 50%. Um, looks like it appears that it meets the setback requirements for, and setbacks, I mean the separation on the side from a property line to the structure, and we'd have four setbacks, two sides, a rear, and a front. Um, and uh, so if we were to look at the current zoning today, um, you know, this meets the standard for a single family house lot, it exceeds the standard, you could potentially carve off today a separate single family house lot, you know, draw another line down here and have another single family house that would be sort of consistent with this pattern along the street. Um, potentially if the zoning changes, um, um, so that, that would result in, and also today you can have an accessory apartment in every single family home. So if we are really to maximize what you could do today, this could potentially be two units as a single family with accessory, and then you could potentially build another single family right here. Obviously, willing seller, willing buyer, all of that. Um, and so potentially you could add, you could have a total of four units on this lot under today's zoning, if you were to build that out. Yeah. So why isn't the city also looking at a space like that as a potential neighborhood garden and instead of you know, um, mm -hmm. getting these big open space plots, um, looking for smaller spaces, maybe spaces that under today's zoning, they're not necessarily empty teeth, but they also, in terms of sustainability, could be used for a neighborhood, and the city doesn't promote that. Is that something that you would think that the city might think about? Mm -hmm. I would, I, I don't, I wouldn't say the city's not promoting that. I think that the idea is that there are multiple um, demands and interests and, and within the sustainable Northampton plan. And not every site like that is necessarily viable for gardening. It's certainly, right, I it, so the zoning is really to allow options. It's not going to result in any development. So right now there's an option for this property owner if he or she chose to carve off a lot and create a separate house. That could happen today. 
Um, but this, and, and as we do development, as, as um, we certainly have on the books already requirements for, in terms of our cluster development, to reserve a uh, percentage of property as open space, and that can be <coughs> for recreation, it could be for passive, um, you know, open space for natural habitat. Um, we also have um, done a lot of work on um, creating more farmland and garden space throughout the city. It's all, uh, this kind of pocket park or garden is, would really be something where the city wouldn't be going and looking to buy bits and pieces in neighborhoods. That would be something more that the property owner could potentially do or offer. Um, but so the zoning isn't really about forcing people to do one thing or another. It's allowing for different <coughs> actions. Question. Um, With, uh, you, you, you talked about dividing that lot and how it might become uh, two houses. If that same lot was bought by a developer, under the proposed guidelines, what would be the maximum they could put in there? Right. I think you should assume that that's 150 feet. As you said, you don't have accurate measurements. <coughs> Let's assume that that's 150 uh -huh. feet. So, um, you know, currently you could potentially do six townhouse units by special permit on this parcel. Hmm. And again, that might be the case where if there's a special permit and someone's, you know, a asking permission to put something in there, there might be um, a discussion about, <coughs> you know, um, um, a benefit that would help, you know, the neighborhood or in terms of potentially a pocket park or something like that. There's nothing in the zoning that would require it, but that, that certainly, w through the special permit process, would potentially be a time where an applicant really needs to look at what those impacts to the neighborhood might be. That, that's under the current or, rules. Right. And what's so, under the new rules? So under proposed um, zoning um, with 50-foot frontage, uh, again, potentially two structures with potentially three units each for a total of six. Or four. Oh, right. Any sort of configuration up to that. That would be sort of yeah. a max. Because we're talking three or four, right? Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, what's currently here is three, but uh, one of the city councilors had suggested that maybe there should be another conversation about allowing four, because three is allowed now in the urban residential B district. Why not three structures if you have 150 foot frontage? Um, well, because you still need to meet the setbacks, and so this is already set back quite a bit, so it eats up some of that frontage. No, but if a developer took it and removed that house, and so you just had that plain square of, uh, of land um, to work on. Yeah. You still, still need 15 feet in between the houses, don't you? Yeah, you would still need 15 feet in between the houses. You know, potentially you could, again, it's... I think under any scenario anywhere in the city, you know, worst case scenario, you could imagine someone tearing down a house and then building, a, you know, multi-family or something. We don't, in, we certainly haven't seen that as a, you know, tearing down perfectly good structures is not really um, a cost-effective means of, of developing a parcel. If you have a perfectly good structure, um, it, it, you really the money is better invested in that structure than building something new. We've seen teardowns, a very small number of teardowns for redevelopment of single-family homes, but not of multi-family homes. <coughs> um, Carolyn, can you just say you mentioned special permit a number of times? Yep. What, what does that exactly mean versus by right? <coughs> Well, a special permit means you you have to apply to the planning board, and in for for townhouse development, there aren't a lot of specifics about how a special permit or why a special permit should be granted. Which has been, uh, I mean, there's some general criteria, but you need to meet general criteria in the zoning in order to be granted a permit by the planning board. Um, so there's a public hearing process. Um, there's an evaluation of impacts to the neighborhood relative to stormwater, with, relative to traffic, um, and um, some other um, evaluation. But and a special the planning board can say no. It's not. It's unlike site plan approval, where site plan approval is really more of a technical standard to make sure that some of these technical functions have been met. 
um, special permit of the planning board can say no, but they really have to have a reason to say no. You know, does it not meet the sustainability plan? I mean, that's the biggest thing. Is it not meeting the intention of the plan? Um, and so again, that's why I would caution, um, you know, blanket special permits for for all sorts of uses because then there's no standard by which the public understands when a permit would be issued or even the board would understand when a permit would be issued or when it would be denied. Um, so you'd want to have really clear standards about why a project <coughs> is so special that it could be granted or not. Yeah. Prefer, you keep using uh, accessory apartments uh, as units, but accessory apartments have other uh, criteria, right? They need to be in an owner-occupied the other part needs to be owner right. occupied, <coughs> can't be at more than 900 square feet. Right. For an accessory apartment. So it's really not, when you say three single family houses with accessory apartments or six units, and it's, it's six units, but it's not the same as, as six units, as, you know, three sectors, the three units. That's, those nine units are, are really different than <laughs> six units that you're allowed. Yeah. Um, potentially, I mean, if it, I think people certainly feel more comfortable with owner occupancy. So in that regard, I think that there might some people might feel like it's it's different. I wanted to put the total build out of units because as a single family home, some people might get the wrong impression that that's all it is. It's one one unit. So, um, but yes, there are other guide criteria that go along with an accessory apartment. Um, so there's another example we talked about is on Hinkley Street, which is another um, um, parcel with quite a bit of frontage. Again, there's this, um, I think it's about 200 feet of frontage. There, because of the location of the structure, you really can't start frontage till, uh, you know, calculating what's left over until you're about 15 feet off of this house. Obviously, the front setback isn't being met, but sides and rear are, um, are currently met. Again, with any of these parcels, I have no idea what the wetlands or topo topographic constraints are. So this is just a really sort of flat surface review of a, of a parcel. Um, so, you know, 200 feet of frontage, I think under current, uh, just sort of quick look at this. Um, potentially, it's 52,000 square feet, so slightly bigger than the previous parcel. Um, could result in two additional lots. Um, so for a total of three single family house lots with potentially again an accessory <coughs> apartment. Um, or by special permit townhouse, seven townhouse units, just based on the lot size and the frontage that are currently at the at the site. Um, with the proposed zoning, if you went down to 50 feet um, feet of frontage, um, you know, three um, potentially three additional structures. Um, with three, uh, sorry, for a total of nine units if you did, um, you know, three units were allowed per, per lot. But again, that, that, that's not evaluating whether the off-street parking is being, that's assuming that you can meet the open space and the off-street parking requirements and that there are no wetlands on the property. When, when, you, when you discussed earlier uh, you, and you brought up some of the, um, uh, some of the concerns that have been earlier voiced about not changing the character of the neighborhood, Sticking nine units there is going to do quite a lot to change the na nature of that neighborhood. Um, I, you know, I think it depends a lot on how it's built out. If you build smaller structures that are sort of in the same, um, th there might you might be able to do a narrow structure with three units back, and it looks like some of these other structures that are on Hinkley Street. I mean, no, it's, yes, it would be different because there's not a big blank space along the street. <laughs> But I think if you're looking, taking a survey of the entire neighborhood and you see lots that are sort of, um, you know, this stands out as a, as a different um, type of lot than let's say these up here where you've got sort of three in a row. So you can sort of see placing that along the same area and it really, you know, if you've got those three structures there, then I would say it could fit in to the character of the neighborhood. But it changes I don't agree. traffic. Dramatically on yeah. the street, I would think, to go from one, one family <coughs> to nine. That's nine. To nine. Nine vehicles instead of one. That changes the neighborhood. Yeah. It? And it'd have to be Humvees because they're going to be driving out on a Hinkley, don't forget. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> are there going to be provisions like say that house went up for sale? I'm just I'm concerned about. Um, I see a lot of houses sit on the market for a while, and then you know two years later they're they're condos, and there's no way I could live in them. Um, so I'm concerned that somebody would buy that, and next year there'd be ten units on that property, That's and they happened. don't they don't necessarily live in any of them, and they're not a ba you know what I mean like they don't right. they're they're a landlord, right? And they're basically uh, so I want to know if there's a provision if you buy a if you buy a structure you have to wait five years to do to do any kind of um, or something of that nature. I'm yeah, not we certainly haven't specific. looked at that. I mean, I think the issue. Um, you know, one of the one of the issues if, with in terms of the cost of housing in Northampton is that there isn't a there's not a lot of uh, there aren't a lot of options in town, which obviously affects the price. Affordable options in town. Well, right, but that's why that's what makes that's one of the things that feeds into that. So the I I mean the more it's not going to address everything because there will be higher end units that are built, and I think. Particularly, I mean, Alex and I had this conversation that um, the other day that um, you know someone building a three-family or four-family is going to trigger anything over two units is going to cost a lot more to build now, um, brand new one because we have the stretch code, and so there are a lot, and so that's good in the sense that they're going to be much more energy-efficient units. Um, on the other hand, once you get over two units, it's my understanding of the building code, that then that triggers um, the requirement for um, fire suppression and, and other things that are not required for single and two family, which would potentially tend to drive up the cost of the units, which might affect their owner occupancy. You know, the higher, it, then it might be, they might be kind of minimized as opposed to having sort of an absentee landlord. Um, but overall, we know that we need units coming into the market at the very low end. Um, but when we've got, we've actually been working on a very <coughs> low end, and those are subsidized units. And we've done a fairly good job of creating subsidized units. But the place where we're missing is that whole middle, which is a big middle, um, for sort of um, what we're ca calling market rate affordable housing which um, covers a whole range of types. You know, they're small units, they're small detached units, they're apartment units, they're condominium units. So I th what the goal is to allow the zoning to be flexible enough so that we can get those sprinkled in neighborhoods um, throughout and so that there are options so that it relieves some of that pressure that that is the thing that's really driving up the cost. But I know there's no guarantee that we'll get affordable units, but the more opportunities we provide for new units here and there, um, we feel is ultimately better to getting towards that goal. Yep. Um, in earlier on, I think of the proposal that said something about um, reducing traffic, and that was kind of my question. I think that's what we're asking here. How does the proposal overall reduce traffic? Because like, I think everybody's seeing like, wow, nine units all together, there's going right. to be a lot more cars on that street. How is, how is the whole plan overall seeing traffic reduced? Well, there are potential, uh, obviously the, the, the plan, the goal is, in, and, and I don't think anybody believes that we're going to get rid of cars. Um, the idea, though, is to allow units that are walkable to students and services in schools so that we can reduce the total number of trips that people are taking by car or have the option of reducing those trips. So yes, on a given neighborhood, there potentially may be a new house, maybe two units, maybe just a single family. And so that household we know will generate, um, will result in trips being taken and, and potentially new traffic on that street. I think overall the idea is we also know that people can't get into Northampton. They want to be here, they want to send their kids to school here, and they shop here, and they eat um, downtown. So they're driving through our neighborhoods now because they live somewhere else or they live in an outlying area and they're coming through our neighborhoods to get to those places that they want to be. So we feel like that will affect the outside trip, the more opportunity we can provide for people to live here and then take some of those trips by walking or biking, then overall um, we've addressed that, some of that growth issue. Mm -hmm. 
Well, what's going to be done about the, the current infrastructure in, in Bay State to, to cope with these changes? I mean, you know the story of uh, Hinckley and, the, and what lies beneath it and what everybody's terrified of digging up and taking a good look at mm -hmm. with all the pipe works and everything. And, um, I mean, as far as I know, I've only lived here for like four or five years, but speaking to people that I know who work for DPW, uh, it's been like that for 10, 15 years. And every year, we put it back on the table and we say this is a priority and this is something that we, you know, that we have to do something about, yeah? You know, and I promise to give up smoking every year. I never do. You know, what... We, we you're, ask, you're asking us to, to say, yeah, we think this is a cool idea to fill in and to populate the area more densely. But honestly, I don't truly believe that the infrastructure that we have uh, uh, is barely, I believe it's currently barely capable of sustaining the load that it's got. And I would hate to think if there are three or four plots down Hinkley where there are nine units being built onto them, all feeding sewage into the system, all needing more water, greater capacity, and off-road vehicles. And don't forget they're paving more things. So we get Sorry? More they're paving more things too whenever there's a new structure coming in because they have to provide parking for whoever's in there. Mm -hmm. So more runoff, more flooding. <coughs> so, so, my que so my question is, what in this plan looks at the infrastructure and what in this plan and this proposal says we're not going to do any of this until we fix that because it's just stupid to do it until that's done. Um, the zoning itself is not does not address the infrastructure needs elsewhere in the plan. We certainly have talked about that in the Parking and Transportation Committee at DPW has a list of prioritized you know, streets and sidewalks and bikeways and, and infrastructure improvements. And um, yes, you're right. We have infrastructure problems that we need to deal with in the city. We also know that new housing is going to be built no matter what. Um, and what we feel is important is to make sure that we're, we're providing the housing um, where it makes sense from a sustainability perspective and at the same time parallel track you know, trying to deal with the infrastructure. But yes, the infrastructure is an issue. And I know an issue about sidewalks came up um, in one of the other discussions as well, that we need to have adequate sidewalks as, um, as part of that plan. So, yeah. um, I just wanted to spin it positively as someone who lives in Bay State. I've been there probably a short time compared to many of you. I've been there for about 11 years. And I love the open spaces of Bay State. And I think that this plan is not as shocking as, I don't perceive it that way, as some people may perceive it, because um, right now in Bay State, the way the zoning is, if someone had millions and millions of dollars, they could come in and buy up a bunch of single family homes and add accessory apartments to them, that they could turn this neighborhood into like condo bill. But what tends to happen in Bay State is a very slow plotting development. Right now, within a few blocks of my home, I live on Norwood, there are many things happening to houses. Rebuilds, uh, uh, there was a great place on Maplewood Terrace that was completely stripped out, re rebuilt into a house. I think the people who tend to come into the neighborhoods and invest money in developing are people who love the character of the neighborhood and they take a little house and they want to make it an efficient, nice house with a good-looking porch. And the porch may be going towards the road an extra five feet. And there's very specific guidelines. So these people politely put their porch on the back where it's in the dark. But they may have preferred a little bit more wiggle room. So if I understand it correctly, what the city is doing is saying, there's a bunch of projects like this. I am one of those projects. So I have a double lot on Norwood. Huge, beautiful double lot. Normally we have an enormous vegetable garden there. But my mother wants to retire and build a small house in the side lot. 
Is it okay if I go into my specific project? Of course, yeah. So um, I've been working with Carolyn, the develop, development office, because behind our house is beautiful wetlands. It's, we had it surveyed, it's specifically wetland. So the house can't go too close to the wetlands, but it has to be set back from the street. So it's fine, it's a small house, we're setting it there. But for me personally, I'm interested in the idea that I could push my house five feet toward the street, which is part of this provision that it's possible right, something could be yeah. moved forward. So that I could have more personal garden space in my backyard, so that I could be farther away from the wetlands, so that what is already preserved, because I'm the one putting money into investing in creating one of these new developments, one of these units, I'm adding traffic to the neighborhood, but it's one person. We would be sharing a vehicle more. She's my relative. So my spin on this whole proposal is Worst case scenarios or massive development, the things that we tend not to like as a community, could happen now. But it doesn't happen that fast. With the new changes, there would be a little bit of wiggle room for people who might want to fill in an empty tooth. And they're trying to put their kid through college and they need rental income. So that's my perspective as a home homeowner who has an actual project that could be affected. I'm happy to follow the zoning rule, rules the way they are, but sometimes zoning rules will affect people in positive ways. I will be even more careful with the open space. I will provide even more, I will preserve permanently more open space in basement. That's just the perspective I want to get. I don't, I don't think, can I, can I answer that? Because I was discussing something similar with Alex earlier. I don't think anybody would really object to you having like an extra few feet so you could put your porch where you wanted to put your mm -hmm. porch. Uh, and I really hope that you build a wonderful house for your mother and that she's happy there and she's comfortable there. Thank you. That's not the concern. Mm -hmm. What the concern is for me, and I'm speaking for me now, mm -hmm. yeah, is the, the leakage that comes with <laughs> this change in the regulations. Yeah? Mm -hmm. yeah, we change the regulations and that enables you to do stuff more flexibly, more easily, which I think should be your right. Mm -hmm. You should be allowed to do that. You should be allowed to make life comfortable for your mother. Yeah? But at the same time, the guy down the road who's looking at the new rules says, I can buy Doug's house, flatten it, and put nine units in there. Mm -hmm. yeah? And they do do it. They don't do it now because they can't really. It's difficult for them. Yeah? But, but that, that's, that's what speculators do. They do this all the time. Right, but I, don't, I guess I would argue I don't think the zoning is going to make it easier for um, the, sort of the speculator to come and do that. I think if a speculator really wants to do that, they'll do that now. And I think um, <clears throat> that so the zoning really isn't necessarily going to open the door and say, OK, you know, we're ready for everybody to But it will, allow, it will, it, it will potentially yeah. allow more units per plot. Yeah, and if it's going to allow more units per plot, then it multiplies the profit that a developer makes on it. It's simple, basic maths. He can make nine units instead of six or five. He can make more money. He's going to want to do it. Of course he is. He's in business. They'd make more tax money, correct? Would they make more tax money because there are more units there on that piece of property? Presumably, I don't know how that tax money uh, so, uh, you know, I could, um, if I, I just want to, actually, maybe this is a, <coughs> excuse me, a good place to interject the, um, we did, there was a concern about sort of this massive redevelopment of, of parcels and how many lots would this really affect if we went, you know, reduce frontage. And so we did a calculation throughout the city, throughout these zones, <laughs> about the total possible lots that could be subdivided and, and created for new lots and sort of basically again looking at a big broad brush sweep not taking any wetlands into effect um, on individual parcels or obviously we didn't have specific setback requirements but the number sort of looking at the total lots that could be subdivided um, not under today's zoning but if the zoning were to change um, 
how many lots that would free up or the potential lots, and that would be assuming that folks wanted to, you know, subdivide their, their parcel. In the urban residential A district, we sort of in generalities looked, and there were about overall for this entire city urban residential A area, about 5% of the parcels could be subdivided. In B, it was less than 1%. Um, and in C, it was about 1.5% um, uh, of the total lots. So, you know, there were, so there had been this discussion about, you know, is this just going to open up the doors and the whole city is going to change? And so we did that, we did that math for that purpose. Um, I wanted to go, because the time is, we're getting to 8.15, I wanted to go to some of the uh, lead, leads example, just to um, show you an A, and A is, is different because, again, it's just um, single family house with accessory unit. Um, and uh, so there's a, I just picked a couple, of the, again, these are random parcels, but on Florence Street, there were a couple of lots that looked um, uh, extra big. So I picked 71 and 55 Florence Street. 71 is um, about 65,000 square feet and 245 feet of frontage. Um, could currently um, potentially subdivide it into two additional single family house lots. So you'd end up with a total of three single family house lots with potentially three accessory apartments. If it changed um, to 50 feet of frontage, um, <coughs> you'd still have um, the same number because again, 50 from 75 to 50, um, given the location of the house, which is right right here, um, <coughs> you know, it wouldn't change the number. And for 55, oops, went back again. For 55, I think it was a similar sort of um, analysis. In this case, there is a side setback issue. So there's a nonconformity here. Um, so, you know, you could potentially divide the lot now um, here. Um, or actually, you can't divide the lot now because there's a, about 115 feet of frontage. Um, but if the frontage dropped, then you could potentially create <coughs> one additional single-family house lot. Um, so that's just an example in Florence. And again, the urban residential A would stay the same in terms of the total number of units. Um, I didn't look at Water again. I didn't look at Water Street, which is the B district, um, <coughs> because that's pretty much built out, and there's not really any way you could um, subdivide those anymore. Potentially, you could add a unit here or there. <coughs> those are, um, you know, um, a pretty much a built-out neighborhood. Even if there's a there is an empty lot right next door to me that was a knockdown house, so they they would only be able to put up one house there. Potentially, I don't know. I don't know what the address is, but um, if it's on the, if there was a house there, um, and it doesn't comply with the current zoning, depending if two years haven't passed, they could come back to the zoning board, or they could rebuild, um, and potentially <coughs> add another unit. The complication is if it's on the river side, um, it's side. on the hillside. There are wetlands also at the base of that hill, so that's another issue that's yeah. hard to. Um, no, exactly, but potentially another unit. Um, but again, B allows up to three units by special permit if you have a certain lot size now. Um, but it, I don't know in terms of off street parking and wetlands issue on that side whether that's feasible. What could happen with something with the church that's for sale? Could that somebody buy that and yes. do so, something with that? <clears throat> well, there's another. Uh, um, yes, that would make it more flexible for that building to be reused. We did do another zoning change last fall or summer, maybe spring, I can't remember how, um, to allow the reuse of historic re religious um, buildings and schools so that they can be adaptively reused um, through approval by the planning board. So there's some relief allowed for the church now. But certainly, um, the that is urban residential. <coughs> On Main Street. The, that <coughs> might still be A. <coughs> Um, I can look up on, a, on the zoning, but I think if it's A, you still can't do more than a single family. But again, they have that ex they have that special reuse uh, provision because it was a church. 
Um, I noticed you had Federal Street up there before you switched over to Lewis. Yeah. And that's like a huge lot. And yep. That's right around the corner from yep. my house. And it's been sitting there for, right. you know, is that providing uh, the city with any tax revenue? At this? There's only one business in it, I believe. Uh, so what the, goes on? The wireworks with, or this? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. What goes on with a property that's sort of. Um, it's well, my understanding. Old, but kind of dormant. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, there is a use, there's uh, whatever the driving school, um, which mm -hmm. actually yeah. wasn't ever permitted, but um, there's, there. um, there's another, <coughs> so I'm, I'm not going to answer anything about taxes because I don't know how the tax assessors um, assess properties, and re but because there was a use, there's my understanding there's some tax revenue coming from that mm -hmm. property. But um, <coughs> if anything would be built there, then that would be considered new growth as far as I understand, so that would change the tax status. But I don't, that's as far as I want to answer in terms of taxing. Um, but the parcel across the street, I think that's all, I don't, again, that's another tax question. I'm not sure if this beautiful paved <laughs> parcel is assessed as a part of this or a separate part as a separately i don't know if that was part of your question or not but um this we had alex and i talked about this as potentially you know what could go on here and i think the reason why nothing has happened here now is because the property owner is trying to decide what to do with the whole thing and right now this sort of goes as a package even though it's across the street it's, you know it's clearly you know, an unfortunate corner for the rest of that neighborhood, the way it stands now. But the landlord wants it to be a business or to, to continue as like a parking lot for employees or something. Well, I think that's our understanding is, or that, you know, he doesn't want to do anything that might jeopardize his ability to sell it to somebody else who might have another right. plan for it. So I think he's waiting to sell it as a package as opposed to saying, well, this really is or could be brought back into the neighborhood as a piece of the neighborhood and maybe create housing here or, you know, divide that into lots. So or as it stands, with the current <coughs> zoning laws, a developer who had enough money, who gave them a good price, could buy the whole wireworks and that lot and make it yes. condos or something, right? Yes. I mean, we've had conversations, or at least one in the past um, handful of years, with someone who was interested in... Um, buying this and developing both sides for townhouses and you know of course this parcel even though the bulk of the building is here is huge it goes back on the other side of the river so that land mass allows a lot of units to be clustered um, in both these locations so there have been there has been at least one discussion in the last couple of years about um, options to um, rebuild this and, um, you know, I, outside of our conversations with them, I mean, the, the, whatever happened between that prospective buyer and the property owner, we don't know, but um, it clearly didn't move forward. Yeah. Let's so, count quickly. How many units could be put in there now under the current zoning? How mm -hmm. many units could be put in there under the proposed zoning? So this is about, just that parcel is about 31,000 square feet and 200 feet of frontage. Um, clearly, lot. it doesn't have 50% open space now. Um, so, um, you know, with 200 feet of frontage now, you could do about, what did I say, three lots, three single family house lots, or by special permit for townhouse units. Um, Are you talking about just the parking lot? Just yes, the parking. just yes. the parking lot. Um, yeah, I didn't look at the other side because there's so many variables, I think, with that building. It's an open lot, it's, it's a parking lot only. Only marginally, it's got a quarter right. of an inch of tile left. Right. <laughs> yeah, afternoon, it would be a building lot. Yeah. yeah. Lots of poison ivy and tar. <laughs> um, so, and then, you know, if it went to 50 feet of frontage, potentially four lots instead of three. Um, again, it's hard to know how many units because once you divide the lot up, if you divide it into four lots, I don't know if you could really meet the parking to max out three units per lot because, mm -hmm. you, you know, you'd have to have um, two parking spaces per unit. So then you might, that's a case where you might bump up against that open space threshold. So you might really only be able to get two units per structure. 
Um, so that one is really sort of <coughs> more of a wild card without really um, laying something out on the ground and having a survey lot. So, you know, anywhere between four now and potentially, I guess, 12 at the total, at the maximum, but that's really with a big caveat about not knowing whether that would even qualify for open space. I mean, in terms of the space so. Is there a difference between a special permit and a variance? Yes. Um, a variance is a mechanism to um, um, use when there isn't any possible use for a property. That's the statutory requirement. You, you, um, a variance really is sort of a, a provision that's granted um, under very special circumstances. In other communities, they don't look at it the way the statute tells you to look at it, and sometimes communities just grant variances and variances. But really, a variance is only supposed to be granted if there's no other, no viable option for the property. Special permit is you have a provision in the ordinance to say, under certain circumstances, you can do X, and then and you need to meet all these criteria in order to do X, and then and the planning board would grant that. A variance is a waiver of zoning. Oh. We're bumping right into 8.30, and I know those are part of it. you want to take one more question, perhaps? Sure. Someone who hasn't asked a question? There were a couple of hands in the back, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, you go. You're the last one. The driveway that isn't paved, that is gravel or dirt, is that counted as, far as part of the open space? No. No. We consider right now anything that's used for parking vehicles because of the compaction that happens is impervious surface. Mm -hmm. And when you have a 50-foot frontage and you have to have two feet, 10 feet on each side, right, as a... 15. 15, so that's 30, which means the building itself could be only 20 feet. Right. Carolyn, you know, if this has just whetted some people's appetite for more zoning information, <laughs> <laughs> what would you suggest at uh, this point? You'd mentioned having some printouts and things. Yeah, so um, there's more information. Well, so uh, let me go over next steps quickly. So the planning board is actually going to be discussing this in two ni Thursday night. <clears throat> um, more about the design piece, and we didn't really even get into the design piece. I mean, you asked about the narrowness of the house. We have lots of good examples from around the country about even narrower house lots that are um, uh, that are being built, single-family house lots in, in other communities. And so we have some design patterns that, um, you know, sort of replicate the what we would call the standard, typical Northampton um, vernacular, or the type of housing that's been um, historically constructed. Um, so we're really, the planning board's going to look at those design standards, what the architects, Kuhn Riddle, was, um, did some work for us to sort of lay out form and what would be appropriate in terms of um, allow or, or granting approval for new structures. Um, so you're welcome to um, either come to planning board meeting, actually NCTV is now um, filming our <laughs> oh, wow. planning board meeting, so if you're um, bored some Friday night, you can flip through and see if they're rerunning them. Um, we're also, the, we will be providing public notice to sort of the next big public outreach, because I think the next step for the planning board is they want to really get grapple the design issue and, and comments that people have made before introducing it to city council. So I don't anticipate that we'll be doing anything in terms of formal introduction until later spring um, time um, and certainly if people have more specific questions they want to email me or um, call me I'd be happy to you know correspond with you that way I didn't put my um, email up here it is on the city webpage uh, on the office of planning development webpage um, which I can go to <coughs> how, uh, how are you handling community concerns I mean does the community have any input at this point yeah, I mean, well, these, um, um, that's funny. Um, yes, I mean, all of these, basically, the reason why we wanted to go around to neighbors is to hear what, you know, people are saying, and the planning board has heard at, at the two previous forums, people have come to planning board meetings at various times to, um, to, um, to talk about um, their concerns. So that's how that's that's been sort of the the process.
process so far is is through those public the public forums <coughs> and through people coming to the board or writing letters or what have you. So I think um, Ward Three did that correct through their neighborhood group. They kind of put a letter together and and sent it to the mayor and people like that. Just right, they, and they've been. Yeah, I mean, they are, this is nothing different from what they've said in the public mm -hmm. forums. And so, I mean, certainly that's being way. I mean, the other piece of it is. You know, there's a sustainable Northampton plan, which has now gone five years now, um, and we've implemented some of that. But I think some people didn't participate at that time, so aren't aware of sort of the, the massive um, realm of it. The other thing we're doing actually this year is we're going to revisit sustainable Northampton um, and go out and do some more targeted <coughs> um, outreach to check back in and say, here's what we've done, <clears throat> are we still on track, what else do we need to do, that kind of thing. So there'll be lots of opportunities that way. So staying <coughs> on top of what's on the website in the, yep. in the planning, uh, in the planning um, page. Right, you can on. also sign up if, if you want to. We have a listserv, which we, will, we send out notice of all the public meetings. So if you want to sign up for it, it means you're going to get every notice that comes out of our office for every meeting. Uh, you may not want to do that, but you can certainly check into the website at various times um, to s if you don't want to be on the listserv, but you can certainly um, sign up for that, and then you'll be specifically notified of any other kind of forum that we do <coughs> about this or any other issue. And you're right, Alice, uh, Ward 3 Association put together a letter and uh, being involved in your local community associations would be another good thing. Uh, to be able to uh, get, your, get yourself heard. Um, so thank you so much, Carolyn, for coming out and sharing with us. I, I heard you mention earlier that, as you've noticed, NCTV is here tonight as well. So I think one possibility, if you want to uh, re review some things that happened tonight, is you'll be able to find that uh, as well on NCTV. To, uh, to remind yourself of what, what you heard and such. Um, and you did have some, some handouts for yeah. if, if folks <clears throat> wanted to grab some, but it is all material that's on, uh, on the web as well. There's a wealth of information there. Right, it's so very all of hard this to read on the web. I've gone there and it's very hard to read. Okay. Yeah. Well, there are handouts here. There's also this presentation that we started doing in September is on the web too, if you, so if you want to look at the slides. Again, it's on our website, but there are a few copies of um, the color document. It's the same thing that's on the web. Um, okay, I can the same stuff that's on the web.